science is an incredible power. It's a power that has helped us to understand things better than previous generations have. That power also enables exploitation and oppression in new and different and sometimes more violent ways than before. Having greater control over the natural world and the human body tempts you into controlling it more. And how would you wrestle with that temptation? Back in the 1600s, the transatlantic slave trade really begins to become an important economic feature. That's when race begins to be solidified along lines of power. Meanwhile, the religious changes that happen especially the Protestant Reformation, telling people, look, it's no longer just your membership in a particular church that gives you this relationship with God. It's just by being what you are. God loves you. You have a personal relationship with God. That language gets turned into you have a standing in society because of who you are. You have some sort of essential characteristic to you such that you deserve liberty. Most famously, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And then you have the great irony but why do these other people not have that kind of standing? And as we extend rights to larger and larger numbers of white men, we remove it more and more from non-white non-men. You have religion that people are perfectly happy to use as justification for slavery. And they do, and they do it all of the time. They say it is part of God's plan in the scriptural tradition for us to enslave certain races. And they're perfectly happy with that. And I think we've struggled to account for, well, why is there this moment where People start to use biology, they start to use geology, they start to use archaeology instead to make that argument. Why would you go from this thing that's been working for you for a long time to this form of knowledge that is sort of uncertain? These new scientists who are emerging in the 19th century are making this case. If we're going to move the future of science and technology forward, and particularly on the question of race, it's got to be based on empirical evidence. Races are not equal and we cannot arrive at this position merely using theology and religion. The American School of Anthropology, which is the term that we use for this collection of men that are mostly centered around the person of Samuel George Morton, the most well-respected, preeminent scientist of his day, and one of his followers or fellow men of science, Josiah Knott. They do have this confidence that there is some divine plan or reasoning or architecture to the races, but that you would learn about it not through studying the Bible, but that you'd learn about it through studying the natural world. One of the things that they do is sort of pair a set of assertions about race with an account of race that's empirical to try to back up those assertions. And so they do things like collect specimens from human bodies most famously, skulls. The argument about who deserves that notion of manhood so that they can have rights begins to be tied to intelligence. And by the time we get to the late 1700s, 
scientists are pretty convinced that intelligence doesn't come from a disembodied spirit, but it comes from the brain meat itself. So you have to figure out how big the brain is. Lots of different ways of measuring that are developed, most famously by Samuel Morton, who will use first seeds and then buckshot to try to come up with a standardized measurement of cranial capacity. They're using all of these things as evidence for their initial assertion called polygenism this term that means that the different races are actually separate species, that they're actually separately created by God. In the 18th century, it was generally thought that there was one human origin. But when we go to the 19th century, the dominance of polygenous thinking changes the narrative. There's not one Adam and Eve. There are, in fact, multiple different Adam and Eves, one for each particular race. What early anthropologists were trying to do is to quantify the differences across human groups in a way that's thought to be unchanging. Separating a group from another group, not just for purposes of saying that there are differences, but for really ranking people. and making sure that the economic and political power structure continues to exist. And so if you can get objective scientific research to uphold right, these laws, to uphold these ideas um, that the white race is superior, then you're, you're gonna use it. You're gonna say, see, I told you, we even have science. So Samuel Morton is publishing some of the first works on polygenism in the 1840s, and then Josiah Knott comes along and also publishes several works during this time. Josiah Knott is someone who I think is much more of a, a champion of the idea. He's really sort of a confrontational figure who's having arguments and debates in newspapers and in public forums, really trying to kind of push and promote the idea of polygenism. And he goes to war with a couple of people, one man in particular named John Bachman, who is a Southern slave owner in South Carolina, who's also an amateur naturalist, but he's a devout Christian and believes, look, the inferiority of the races is supported by the Bible and is supported by biblical doctrine. And you would think Josiah Knott would agree with him because politically, they're after the same thing. Black subjugation, white superiority, that's what they want. But Josiah says, the problem, though, is that you cannot make these arguments based upon religion. These arguments must be made based upon scientific thinking. Looking from the present, when science is so authoritative, we just sort of read that back into that moment. We say, like, well, of course they turn to science because science is the authority. And that doesn't actually make sense. Science isn't the authority um, at that moment. And when we realize that it's not obvious that you would turn to science, you have to ask yourself, well, why are they? And that, for me, it's because it gives them a capacity to control things more, to control things better and more precisely. You now have an actual tool that can prove that black people are legitimately inferior. And the sort of kicker is, when you recognize that, it changes what you think of as science, right? Because you do have science is curiosity about the natural world, you do have science as understanding the natural world, but it's also science as um, mastery, it's science as control, it's science as literal power. The Dred Scott decision happens in 1857, and what it essentially declares is that African Americans have no rights that the United States government can recognize or should recognize because they are populations that are biologically inferior to Europeans and white people. And so when you see Taney's decision in Dred Scott, 
He is channeling the scientific thinking of the time. He is making this case. The science has showed us that the biology of Africans and Europeans, they're not equal. So why should we have a democratic society that recognizes or gives rights to enslaved populations? Why should we do that? It would go against the natural laws that govern our world. And in fact, if we do that, we might threaten the kind of order, the social order that is both political and social, but more than that, ordained by God, embedded in nature, and as a part of a larger kind of cosmological destiny for American people. In Jamaica, which is still heavily, heavily, heavily segregated, even after formal slavery has ended in the British Empire, a black preacher says, look, we don't have to take this from these white oppressors anymore. And there's a, an uprising and it's brutally crushed by the governor of Jamaica, Governor Iyer. This is outrageous to the British literati. And in polite society, there is a strong division over whether we think Africans who now live in the Caribbean, so black people, are on equal standing with white people. And what we would think of as polygenism whether or not you can ever have equality of the races, or if they're always separate and unequal, is absolutely the thing that's being debated. And interestingly, what motivates Charles Darwin in the writing of The Descent of Man. By 1871, when he was the leading person of British science, he wrote a chapter in The Descent of Man called On the Races of Man, which was specifically designed to demonstrate that polygenist ideas of human origins were false and address this notion that you could um, unambiguously rank human races and demonstrate that that was not true either. Darwin says, look, the polygenists are wrong because they're working with a shortened period of time. We just extend the human timeline further back in the past. There's plenty of time for an original population somewhere in Africa, he believes, to give rise to the, all the various different racial groups. And therefore, this idea of separate human ancestry just doesn't make sense at a scientific level. So for Morton and Knott in the early 19th century, that American School of Anthropology, they believed they could use science to study race, but they still thought race came from God. What Darwin does with sexual selection in The Descent of Man is he takes God entirely out of the picture. And the view that he builds in that text is that race comes entirely out of human sexual preferences and human sexual choices. And so what becomes possible is the view that race could be entirely controlled by people and their actions. And this is why Darwin thinks a great deal about the various things that cultures produce to enable the passing on of certain traits within a population through reproduction, and how populations that are very successful choose the best traits to pass along to the next group. If in the early 19th century, the mastery is about under, understanding race in a way so that you could control it. In the late 19th century, we are the masters of race. There is no other place that race is coming from. It's not given to us by God. It's only coming out of our sexual choices and actions and preferences. It's an astonishing moment, actually, because what you're saying is that what you desire out of race, you can get it if you can control who's having sex with who and what children they're having. In the early 20th century, people think we have finally solved poverty. We have finally solved disease. Everyone from feminist birth control advocates to Protestant ministers saying, for centuries we've been trying to solve the world's problems and now finally science has given it to us. We need to breed people better. Mm -hmm. 
The strict definition of eugenics is try to improve society by intervening biologically or genetically on the population. And we can do that in a couple ways. One, we could find all the people who have good genes that make them socially successful, intelligent, healthy, beautiful, make sure they get together, have lots of babies, so we encourage them. Or if you want to be a little bit more draconian, if the social maladies that we see in the world, uh, poor achievement in school, criminality, addiction, uh, whatever it might be, well, maybe we can make sure that the people who have those traits don't have kids. We could sterilize them. We can incarcerate them so they're locked up during their reproductive years. We're going to improve society by removing these bad elements and making sure they don't reproduce into the next generation. That idea keeps slipping in what makes us who we are, whether that's a racial group or whether that's a behavioral social group, is our biological inheritance. Bad things happen when we get it wrong. Millions of people can die when we get it wrong. Perhaps there's a different way of understanding the world. You see a shift um, primarily after World War II uh, that begins to start to think about things a little bit differently and really question um, what is the evidence for races. Um, and we see that there's not really great evidence uh, for that. And even before we get to introducing genetics into that conversation, you know, there were cultural anthropologists uh, that, that worked on addressing this question and really worked to undermine this idea that race was actually biological. People like W.B. Du Bois and Franz Boas were going to hammer home on the notion that we are all brothers and sisters under the skin. And we're only interested in difference in as much as it explains different cultural expressions in different parts of the world. Meanwhile, in biological, physical anthropology, people are still talking about five distinct lineages of humanity. So it's where you put the emphasis. Do you put the emphasis on the unity or do you put the emphasis on the difference? Interestingly, every time there's a public legal movement in civil rights, you see that physical anthropology side doubling down on difference being hardwired and that we could never really achieve true unity between the races. Well, equality in every sense of the word is obviously a myth. There, there are no people who are equal, no two people. There are no two races who are equal. They have different qualities. And this is an objective matter that can be determined by objective standards. When you understand black people have literally been saying, hey, we're no different biologically or otherwise, it created a political movement. As biology grew and became more sophisticated in its understanding of, of how organisms worked, we arrived at the conclusion that our species, anatomically modern humans, in fact really does not have biological races. So black, white, Asian, 
African, European, those are not actually biological units. Those are socially constructed historical classificatory schemes that do not map to genetic or morphological or ecological differences. If you were an anthropologist from Mars, and you didn't know our racial history, you didn't come through our Judeo-Christian tradition, you didn't have our long legacy of racism and colonialism, and you just came down and you said, find the races. I would test genetic distance. I would say, who has more variants and alleles in common? Who has more stretches of DNA? I've done my genetic analysis, and now I'm back, and, and I can tell you decisively what the five races of man are. West Africans, East Africans, South Africans, North Africans, and everyone else. What, what, no, that's, no, no, no. The idea has always been that what we see is ratified or certified or expanded upon by what we see scientifically uh, under the skin. But every strategy that scientists have taken to look under the skin, whether it's, let's compare the skulls, let's compare the blood types, the story ends up being, ah, it doesn't work that way. So race is real, absolutely, without a doubt. It's just not biology. And so that's what's hard for people to understand, that these social constructs, these ways of being, these structures of history and politics and economics and health are very, very real, but they're not explained by our biology. We are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. I think that the hope for the Human Genome Project was that it would, it would solve this sort of social problem for us. I believe one of the great truths to emerge from this triumphant expedition inside the human genome is that in genetic terms, all human beings, regardless of race, are more than 99.9% .9 the same. All that racial hatred, all that animosity, all that sense that we're really super different and that drives so many conflicts in American society, that if the genetics proved that wasn't real, if the genetics proved that that was uh, something we didn't have to worry about anymore, that American society might be able to move beyond it. Modern science has confirmed what we first learned from ancient faiths. The most important fact of life on this earth is our common humanity. My greatest wish on this day for the ages is that this incandescent truth will always guide our actions as we continue to march forth in this, the greatest age of discovery ever known. What happens after the sequencing of the human genome, which is really, I think, an important part of this story, is that we get another version of what happened when Darwin made the case that humans share a common ancestor. Well, we are 99.98% the same. There are are no genes that are unique to one race that are not found in another. So the idea of race doesn't have a biological or genetic basis. And we're in this space for maybe a year or two, but then geneticists come along and say, well, if we just look at the genome with enough sort of careful attention, we'll find these correlations that actually show that there is a genetic basis to human difference. It turned out that we needed different kinds of comparisons within the science to make any meaning of it. What are the comparisons that make the most sense to us based on this historical legacy? Well, let's start comparing black people to white people, to Latino people, to Native American people, to Asian people, and suddenly we can find differences if we call those groups our baseline groups, we can find differences. But that's not to say that those differences make the groups. And then, on the highest level, why did we pick racial groups in the first place as the thing we want to compare? A lot of these ideas are reciprocating ideas. Just when you think that there's a scientific revolution and they look like they're gone, they come back in a different skin. have to recognize the kind of role that racialized power structures play in the material practice of science. Our science continues to translate the beliefs in our culture. We have to undo those belief systems if we want our science to really articulate forms of equality that we know to be true now. We know what the science is. 
but people are rooted in embracing a system um, that essentially creates difference and harm. We are still in a place where our desire to create racial hierarchies or to preserve racial hierarchies is structurally part of our practices of natural knowledge. It is part of the, the old adage that knowledge is power. And who constructs knowledge gives them a tremendous amount of power over society. How do you change power? You have to change the narrative that builds it up to begin with. You have to change the way that it's taught to the next generation. And I think until we have that courage to confront this history, we'll keep having the kinds of mistakes and conversations that take us back, take us back to the time of the very founding of this nation. We've always gotten it wrong. Can we even get it right? I don't know. But as long as there are people who are willing to do the work, that to me gives me hope. I think it's at least worth continuing the conversation. If we can't even talk about it, then there's no hope I've ever made.